Okay, I'm gonna start with a question. So why do you guys think we are interested in language modeling? Any thoughts? For pre-training, yes. So that's the answer I was looking for. So you don't, uh, you are not interested in language models for the sake of language modeling, okay? Because language modeling is like, I give you a word and then you predict the next one. That's not an interesting task on its own. You do it because you want to do pre-training because you have a lot of data on the internet. They are unlabeled data. You are gonna learn something from those data and then you want to do transfer learning and then go back to your uh, classification task, sentiment analysis. So those are the target tasks or uh, translation. Once you have a good language model, it's gonna help you do some transfer learning on new tasks. So we are not interested in language models for the sake of language models but because they're gonna help us do transfer learning. And we already saw a version of transfer learning. Can somebody remember? So when we were doing uh, word embedding, we were doing some transfer learning at the first layer of our neural networks for classification or for uh, translation. So we already saw an example of that, some transfer learning. And actually the field of uh, language, uh, natural language processing is these days taken, taken by uh, transfer learning. So you can just rename it to be transfer learning. So this paper is gonna expand upon word representations, but uh, we saw before that per each word in our dictionary, we had a vector. It means that per each word, we have only one meaning, but we know that words are gonna change meaning according to their context. For instance, bank can have two different meanings. If uh, you're talking about a river bank, it has a different meaning compared to when you're talking about a money bank. So if you assign only one vector to your words in the dictionary, you're gonna associate with that only one meaning. So the idea of this paper is that you can have multiple meanings for your words, depending on the context. And how can we do that? The model is going to be called uh, ELMO, embeddings from language models. So what is our data? Our data is a, is a corpus of size n. So that's a sorted corpus. One word is going to follow the next word. And you can have a forward language model. So what is a forward language model? You want to know the probability of this sentence happening. You can use the chain rule for probability, so there is nothing wrong with that. And it can decompose your condition, your uh, joint distribution to conditional distributions. So you first know the first, the first word, and then you can predict the next word. Then you know the first two words, and then you're predicting the third word, etc. And that's the product of all of those. We saw this before when we were doing word representations. So for each word, you had a vector, and that's that vector. And this one is a context independent token representation. Yes, during training, you are looking at the context, but for each word, you have one meaning. For instance, you cannot model bank having two different meanings. So that we know, K corresponds to this K here. So that's the index of the word that you're predicting. You can take XLM, that vector, in addition to the other vectors that you have and push that through L layers of LSTMs. So a sequence goes in, a sequence comes out. You take that sequence, you push it through the next LSTM and you do it multiple times. So we are still using LSTMs. You push it through L layers and in the end, you're gonna get H forward of uh, this index K and you're gonna have J layers. So J is counting the layers. So these guys are still vectors. Okay, so far so good. If you keep track of each basically representation after each LSTM? Yes, exactly. So that's what we are doing. It's not only the last layer, but it's all of the layers in between. So we are keep keeping track of what is happening per each layer, per each stack of your LSTM. Then the last layer, the hidden state of the last layer, you take it, you push it through a softmax, and then you do your prediction. You predict the next word. And that's how you're modeling your probability, okay? That's a forward language model. You can have a backward language model as well. The, there is uh, basically the order doesn't matter how you want to do your decomposition. You can do your decomposition 
and predict the word at TK conditioned on the future words. And still you get the joint distribution of your corpus. Okay, if that's the case, you can write a model for this. You can have a backward LSTM, stacks of that, L stacks of backward LSTM. And now you can have a bidirectional language model. How do you train this? How do you train the weights of this LSTM? In addition to your context independent word representations, uh, you just take a log of this objective function and the other objective function and add them up. So you're giving equal weight to the forward and backward language models. If you take the log of the product, it's gonna give you the summation of the logs. Now here you see all of your parameters. These tokens are your context independent token representations. So these are your word vectors. Your LSTMs are gonna have parameters. The forward LSTM is gonna have its own parameters. The backward LSTM is gonna have its own parameters. And then the softmax that's giving you the probability of the next layer, the next word, it's gonna have its own parameters. And these are the parameters of your softmax. Now you're optimizing this, you're maximizing this log likelihood with respect to these parameters. Okay, once that's done, this is called pre-training. And as you can see, you don't need to have labels for your data. It doesn't have to be a translation task. It doesn't have to be a classification task. So you just learn these weights using this objective function. It's unsupervised. Once you learn them, you're gonna end up with a set. And that's exactly the question that you asked. Are you gonna keep track of all of these hidden outcomes? And the answer is yes. So you take your word representations, you put it in this set, RK, the forward hidden states, the backward hidden states for all of the layers, not only the last one, but all of the intermediate ones. You just put them in this set. Actually, you can make that notation simpler by setting HK0 to be your initial word vectors. Now this HK0 is gonna be your X of LM. So now you are just making the notation easier and you can stack the forward and backward hidden states in one vector that has twice the size of the other ones individual, individually. So what is the Elmo representation then? You don't want to have a set, you want to have a vector per each word. Now for each word, K or TK, we have a set. You want to turn the set into a vector. So you can have a function here. This is a general formulation for Elmo, for word K. This is, a, this is an example of that function. It could have no parameters at all. And you're just taking the last layer and uh, you're just representing this set by one of its entries, the last entry. That's one version. Another version is to actually have some parameters. These are task dependent parameters. So these have to be optimized when you're doing your downstream task. What are you gonna do? You take all of your layers, intermediate layers, and let's say you have a budget of one that you're spreading among all of these layers. So whenever you have a budget of one, there is a softmax. So these SJ tasks, there is a softmax on it, but then you can increase your budget by multiplying it by lambda task. So now you're increasing your budget from one to, sorry, this is gamma task. So this theta task is now gamma task and SJ task. SJ tasks add up to one. So what are we gonna do? Now you have a classification task, a sentence goes in, and maybe you want to classify the sentiment. Previously, you had only the context independent token representations for your words. Now you take your words, push them through these forward and backward LSTMs, get Elmo K task. So you get this guy, you concatenate the two. Now this is the input to your task RNN. And let's say you have an RNN for your task, or you can have uh, your RNN for the task, you take XK, you push it through the RNN for the task, you get HK, and then before you push it through your softmax for classification purposes, you just add this uh, vector here, you just concatenate it. So you can have different versions of it. You can play around with how you want to use these representations. Do you want to use it at the first layer as the input to your RNN, or you just want to concatenated to the output. So you have flexibility of how you want to use it. 
it's going to have its own parameters. Now you're going to write down your loss function for your target task or your downstream task. And let's say your downstream task is question answering. Maybe somebody gives you a question and it gives you four answers and you want to select the correct answer. That's question answering. You can have textual entailment and each one of these have their own data, but their data is much smaller compared to the data that you use to train your language model. It could be textual entailment. Uh, you have a premise, given the premise, is the hypothesis true or no? You can have semantic role labeling and the task is uh, this word, is it a person? Is it, is it correspond to a who? Or is it did what? Is it an action? The action is done to whom? And the action is done where? You can have coreference resolution. So these are different downstream tasks. You can say, I want to cluster the mentions in the text that refer to the same underlying real world entity. Maybe the real world entity is a person. And sometimes for the person, we are gonna use uh, he, she, they, et cetera. And they are referring to the same real world person. And we want to highlight that. We covered, uh, we saw an example of named entity recognition where each word had to be classified as a person, location, organization, or miscellaneous. And we saw semantic analysis, or sorry, sentiment analysis, sentiment classification. So here are some uh, tasks and some data sets for you to explore. SQUAD is a Stanford question answering. SNLI is a Stanford natural language inference. Semantic role labeling is SRL. CoreF is coreference resolution, NER is named entity recognition, and SST is sentiment, Stanford sentiment tree bank. And uh, sometimes you're using F1. F1 is a weighted average between precision and recall as your performance metric or some other techniques. These are highly optimized methods for that particular task. So they are not using language models. You can have a baseline system, which is an RNN, doing the classification if you're doing sentiment analysis. And it hasn't seen any unlabeled data. So there is no pre-training going on. That's the baseline. If you add LMO representations to those baselines, all of these scores are gonna improve. And these are the percentage improvements. So these are huge improvements. And in the end, how does it differ from uh, GLOV or word vector representations? And to understand that, let's take a word. Let's take play. Play can have multiple meanings according to the context. If you use nearest neighbor and you find the nearest neighbors of play, so you have a word vector for play and you're gonna have word vectors for other words in your dictionary, you can compute their distance and that's gonna give you the nearest neighbors. And these are the nearest neighbors. Playing, game, games, played, players, play. So it turns out that all of them are conveying the same meaning. But now if you take into account the context of the word play. So now play in this sentence has a different meaning than play in this other sentence. And to understand that, you can find the nearest sentence that contains a play to this sentence here. And uh, you can see that this first sentence correspond to probably baseball. So that's playing baseball or this one is uh, about acting or playing. It's about actors and actors playing, okay? Now, this mm -hmm. is the way that you're gonna convey multiple meanings for your work. So there are is those, a question. Are those nearest neighbors in the, like, in the context of the source or is it just the semantic meaning of like the word or is like the sentence that you input with play related to the nearest neighbor? So what you're gonna do is you take this sentence, you're gonna push it through your uh, LSTMs, but then you're going to take a look at the representation for this word. So let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, six. So you're going to take a look at the representation for the sixth word. And that's going to be this Elmo here. You do the same thing here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You look at the representation of the ninth word in this sentence. That's going to give you another Elmo. Then uh, you're gonna do the same thing for your other sentences that contain the word play in them. 
Now you have a word vector for play. You have another vector for play here. If they are close to each other, you're going to report it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I had two questions then. One is that that kind of limits the words that are um, nearest to neighbors to only only the exact same um, spelling word, right? Like you, you weren't, you're not going to find um, production as a synonym for play. Uh, no. So those sort of tasks, you can... Uh, now you have vectors for those two words. And if their vectors are close to each other, they probably have the same meaning. Yeah. So no, the, what we are looking at here is you have the same word. Previously, you had only one vector corresponding to it, but now you can have multiple vectors depending on the context. So now this play is going to have a different vector compared to this play. Yeah. Okay. The other question I had was about the, um, the soft max for predicting the next token, TK plus one in the left column. So okay. when, you, when you have the, um, the output of layer L from the LSTMs, you end up with K vectors that are each, I don't know, some hidden dimension. And then you do a, a fully connected layer from that to some vector which has as many entries as the number of um, tokens or your vocabulary size, right? Yes. So for this last layer, the softmax layer, uh, I'm deliberately being a little bit vague and there is a reason for it because these parameters could be spread across all of these words at the last layer because a sequence goes in an LSTM, a sequence comes out. Mm -hmm. And this is the last layer of all of your LSTMs. You can actually look at the last word or the last representation, or you can look at all of them and multiply okay. them by a, by a bunch of parameters. But whatever that you do, you're going to push that through a softmax. So yeah, we are being a little bit vague here for good reasons. Because there's, there's many different design choices for how to, how to get the softmax word prediction done. Yes, exactly. But usually it's the last layer and the last entry, so the case entry that you're going to use to, if you want to do classification. Or no, here you want to do predict the next word, which is basically a classification task. Okay. Any other questions? How are we minimizing the objective? Like, what is the objective here? You have two objectives. Mm -hmm. One objective is pre-training. So you want to learn your ELMO representations. For that, you're maximizing this loss function. That's exactly your loss function with respect to these parameters. The parameters of your tokens, LSTM, and your softmax. That's going to give you ELMO, and then you're going to fix it. You can fix those parameters. Now you can go to your task. Your task is, a, let's say, is a sentiment analysis task. A sentence goes in and a class comes out of uh, positive uh, review or negative review, let's say. Then that task is going to have its own RNN. It's going to have its own softmax. And it's going to have its own loss function. And it's going to have its own data. You take that data. And then in addition to whatever that you were doing before, you were doing a word representation and pushing it through your RNN. Now you're going to add these ELMO vectors, either at the input or at the output layer. By add, I mean you just concatenate it. So this, is, uh, this layer here is right before your softmax for your sentiment analysis. And then you're going to have a loss function for that. That loss function, you're going to optimize with respect to the parameters of your task RC and RNN. So you're going to have a task RNN. You're going to minimize your loss function with respect to those parameters. And these uh, gamma and SJ. Do you see my screen now? It's, um, we can see it, but it's still frozen where your cursor is pointing at Elmo, at least for me. Is it better? No. Oh, oh, yeah, we can see now. OK, perfect. So where were we? Task RNN. So yeah, you have your task are, so now you have your downstream tasks. They're gonna have their own loss. They're gonna have their own network. In addition to whatever that you were doing before with your word vector that you were doing before, you're gonna add these ELMO representations. And then you can, param you can optimize over these parameters. When you're optimizing your downstream, downstream task, you can optimize these parameters as well. Does that answer your question? So uh, the ELMO vectors get fine-tuned as well, right? Uh, yes. You can fine-tune them if you want. So you can fine-tune 
this uh, all of these parameters if you want in your downstream task. Okay. So okay, then your downstream questions? tasks will have multiple representations of the same word. One is the original and the next is the Elmo representation as input. So your downstream task is going to have your XKs, yes, your word representations in addition to Elmo representations. One of them is taking into account the context, the other one is not. Okay, does that answer your questions? Uh, can a particular word have uh, different meanings in a particular downstream task? Oh, absolutely. It's exactly what we are doing here. That's the whole objective here. Mm -hmm. So the, the word play here is going to have a totally different meaning than the word play in the other sentence. That's the whole purpose of what we are doing. Okay? Yeah. And so then depending on the amount of times play is mentioned in your input sentences, you could have multiple Elmos of play, but then only one word, one only XK that represents play. Yes, so you have one XK that represents play, and then you can have, depending on the context, you're going to have a different Elmo, because this Elmo is going to go through a bunch of uh, LSTMs, okay? All of these words matter, spectacular, on, made, etc. they matter to give play another meaning. And it seems like you could get even a different Elmo meaning depending on how um, big the sentences that you choose to input are. Like you could, you could use a, I don't know, a five word window or a 10 word window and those are going to give you different Elmos. Uh, yes, that's correct. So do they always just default to a fixed um, sequence length or do they do naturally just based on where, where sentences end? Uh, for the LSTMs, at least during inference time, you don't need to have a fixed sentence length. You can have variable length inputs and that's fine. So you can take a look at where the sentence starts and where it ends, because that's an LSTM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it seems like a lot of times they try to maximize the um, like the the amount of tokens that you can pass into a GPU at once. You try to make make your batch really large, but it seems like that could be problematic with this because if you make your context too big, it kind of um, like would would reduce the importance of the sentence you actually care about if you include an entire paragraph at once. Uh, so that depends. This could be sentence by sentence. Yeah. Okay. Shall we move on? Okay. Sounds good. 